Welcome everyone. The date is February the 16th, 2007. Another HighSpots.com production. We have got, for the first time on camera in a number of years, we've got Tully Blanchard and the Perfect Ten Baby Doll. It is our honor and pleasure to have them here. Ringside with HighSpots.com. How you guys doing tonight? Great. Really good. Fantastic. Well, what we want to well, do... You, you said that with so much emotion. <laughs> Didn't she sound like the perfect 10 right there? Absolutely. Huh? Through and through. What we really, <laughs> what we really want to do tonight is kind of focus on the two of you together and the time that you spent together uh, in Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, Jim Crockett Promotions. Less about your, your necessarily your history in the business, but more about the time together as this is the reuniting of Tully Blanchard and the perfect 10. Uh, I guess maybe the... the best place to start, and we can backtrack a little bit if need be, would be uh, how did you guys get put together uh, as an act working for Jim Crockett Promotions? As an act? As a, as a manager and a wrestler together. Uh, what was, how did you guys first get put together? Whose brainchild was that? Well, actually, we had a Perfect Ten contest, and uh, we started asking at the end of 1984, uh, the search for the world's perfect woman. That was my search. And we used to take, we took pictures, took this. Actually, we were looking, Crockett and Dusty, who was the booker, was, we were looking for Sunshine and couldn't find her because she was in a rehab someplace. <laughs> and, uh, and we did a show because of Dusty's relationship with the Grams. And Christmas week, we did some joint shows with uh, down in Florida. And Nicola was down there. And Dusty saw her in the dressing room. And I saw her in the dressing room. And Dusty and I immediately went to our office and, comp and said, <laughs> That's her. <laughs> And in February in Spartanburg, I think it was February. Was mm -hmm. it February? January. It was was a, it January? Uh, it was supposed to be February, and then you guys kept moving it up because it was six weeks, and then it was four weeks, and then it ended up being like two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks? Yeah. Well, anyway, said, in Spartanburg, on. I walked out with the world's perfect 10. Had your paths ever crossed before? I know both of you uh, from mm -hmm. Texas, both of you had spent time, both of you actually worked with Gina Hernandez at different points in your careers. So you two knew each other before. I would met Tully whenever he was um, working in Amarillo and you were doing the DJ deal at the West Texas State. And you when were I was wrestling. going to school, when mm -hmm. I was refereeing and yep. stuff. Remember you come down to Lubbock? Oh, that's right. And you had the I leather did. jacket with the blood on it and stuff. I was about like 14 years old, 13, 14. She was taller than me then, too. <laughs> what are, uh, I guess, both of your memories of being uh, in Texas at the time? Both had, both of you actually had similar beginnings getting in the business, both second generation, both mm -hmm. from Texas. What are, I guess, your memories of that uh, and how you both kind of came up in the business? Uh, like I said, sort of similarly, both from Texas, both second generation. I'll go first. Um, both of my parents were wrestlers during the 50s, 60s. My dad wrestled some during the 70s. Um, I actually had a playpen in the back room where the guys met before the matches. Um, my dad promoted where we had the matches on Wednesday night at Fair Park Coliseum. My dad's promotions had the, um, the shows on Saturday where I could watch him um, do the show. It was on 2 o'clock Saturday afternoons. Um, if we were really, really good, my brother and I on holidays and summer vacations could go to the matches when we were in school. And then when we got old enough to work, <laughs> my dad put us to work and we sold programs. We did the concession. We set up rings. We set up chairs. We did everything. Sold and programs? Sold programs, T-shirts, whatever there was to go. You sell popcorn? Yes, I did. I bagged a lot of uh, Yes, all of it. And so I, I had more of the mechanical part of the promotion, while Tully was more in the feature part of the promotion. Mm -hmm. You didn't set up any rings? You, you oh, set I set rings up when I was 10 years old. And I put out flyers, and I bagged popcorn, and I sold soda water. Yep. I swept the WrestleThon in San Antonio, Texas, when the janitor didn't show up. Yep. Getting it ready for the next. Very, very similar. Very similar. Would the two of you say it's 
it's an advantage or a disadvantage to be second generation coming in. A lot of people see the advantages that come to it, but maybe don't see, you know, the, a lot of the work that a lot of the, the second generation people, it kind of gets impressed upon them. Like you said, sweeping up the coliseums. And I don't know if it would be an advantage. It's a privilege. It would have been, for me, it was a privilege because I love the business. I even wrote theme papers about it in, in school, you know, about how wonderful the business was and how to promote a show and how to get people in, in the building and <laughs> how angles worked in the whole nine yards. I was doing school papers on it. You were exposing the business before it was well, popular. Well, no, it, was, it, it wasn't. It there was, you go. I wasn't even smart until the first time until the Joe Harry Coliseum when they gave me the first finish. And I was like, oh, that's how they do it. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> And I'm sitting there and I'm like this on the inside and I can't let them know what's going on. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Well, the thing that it does is it, it gives you a different perspective of the business. And you appreciate when the place is full and you know that there's just as much hard work when it's not full and it's your job to get it full. And so you just, you you really don't have the you know how to be a star and act like a star without really getting too engulfed in your own press clippings in other words you think it keeps you it helps keep you humble mm -hmm. oh absolutely mm -hmm. I mean because you know you know what it is you know and and what it takes to make it happen you know I mean it's it is when you used to sit and, and do interviews all day Wednesday and watch the TV crew slave away getting those TVs out and especially in like 85 when we were together but the next couple of years when we were on 287 syndicated markets uh, my gosh the effort that it took to put that out live every week you know you you realize that, that it's a team making it happen you know it's not just the four horsemen or not just me and baby doll or not just dusty roads walking out there and wiggling our butts can i say that mm -hmm. you did okay mm -hmm. with all that that you're exposed to so early what are some of the things that maybe still surprised you that you were still uh like i said surprised by or taken by surprise to learn about the business later on like as you were first starting out or first really getting into the business in front of the scenes and in the ring what were some of the things that took you by surprise even though you had been around the business for so long every day was an adventure it's not that just one thing every day was so different the first year that we worked together in 85 we had 15 days off the whole year the whole year 15 days off and every day it was travel and going somewhere and doing something and that's one of the wonderful things about the business you can go to Richmond every other week and do the show but every other week it's going to be totally different you know and it's and that's one of the fun things about it was it was an adventure every day to go out with these guys I always felt safe around her <laughs> your protection I can whip some ass she beat that Navy guy up in Hampton that was all and then had him arrested is there a story behind that that we can get no. into we had worked a match with, uh, you tagged him with Abdullah. And we were headed oh, back God, to... Oh, God, did I really? Yeah. Ooh. And it was uh, Tully and Magnum, or no, it was uh, Dusty and Magnum against Tully and Abdullah. Abdullah hit, the, as soon as the match was over, he was in the dressing room out of there. And we were headed back, and the guy chopped me, remember? Yeah. And I laid him out. And then had him arrested. Mm -hmm. The trouble was we had to go to the police station and sign the papers... And we had 350 miles back to Charlotte from Hampton. And who drove? Well, you did, because I couldn't stay awake. That's right. I always drove. Are there any other uh, stories that come to mind about overzealous fans or people that, that really took it seriously? You guys had as much heat on you as any heel in the territory. And, and we had no security. We had no get barricades. The police didn't like us. Nobody liked us. Try working your way through fifteen to 20,000 people every single night, fighting your way back to the ring and then back. And try being a girl and having guys like reach up through your legs and seeing their hand right there. That's always real attractive. Thanks, guys. Good move. <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she wasn't this obnoxious when she was younger. <laughs> or try going to 
And what's funny was y'all would go to the bar, y'all would be all showered and all fresh and everything, and here I'd have big loogies and beer all in my hair and crap, and I'd have to go sit back in the hotel and get cleaned up. <laughs> yeah, but then you came shining into the bar. No, the bar was closed <laughs> by the time I got done, waiting for Flair to comb his hair out. <laughs> <laughs> we can't tell all the stories. Okay. That actually uh, jumps ahead a little bit. I was going to ask if you traveled together, and if so, how much, you know, back in the, on the Crockett schedule. Shoot. We even, God, we were together, what, first five months every single day. And then I got. Well, except for the one time you ran off with Buddy Landell. That was stupid. Is there a story there to get into, maybe? No, there's no story there. <laughs> there's nothing there. There's nothing to see here. Keep walking. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why you wore the hat to cover your eyes? <laughs> no. No, I'm okay. I just look old. See, we are old. <laughs> Experienced. That's right. <laughs> hey, I'm still breathing. A lot of our friends aren't. <laughs> That's true. You uh, touched on it a little bit, Baby Doll, when I asked about the overzealous fans, but what was the overall experience like uh, being not just a lady on the circuit, but really more or less the only one at the time? It was it was a lot of fun. You know, it'd be like in the dressing room with all these guys, and they were like really good looking, and they all smelled really good. And um, But m first and foremost, I think that Tully will... will back me up on this, I always acted like a lady because I had my dad back in Texas and I was brought up right and I always had my chair in the corner with my Stephen King book and you know, I'm just... She did. I did really well. I wasn't one of those girls that just dropped everything and was just walking around with nothing on. I, I was always a lady in the dressing room, wasn't yes, I? Yes, you were. But um, going to the ring, if you look at the girls now, you know, they've got barricades where it's like 10 foot on each side where the people can't touch you. We didn't have barricades. We didn't have security. We had sold out houses almost every single night. The uh, It was a chore just to get to the ring. And then once we had worked, it was even more of a chore getting back out of the ring to the dressing room. Um, that's why I wore like the black leotards, like the one piece things, because it, I thought it made it a little bit more difficult for guys to like get to me. But man, guys were like, it was hard, man. I was bruised up all the time and had my hair pulled and had that girl yeah. in Fayetteville that pulled my hair and reached bound and I was going to hit her and she was pregnant and it was like the cartoon where like, oh, I got to stop because I was going to hit her and well, it's earrings the, pulled out and the, spit on. and In 1985, nobody had ever done anything like we had done, okay? And, and Baby Doll, the perfect 10, was the focus of everything that I talked about. If you look at the interviews, it was nothing but taking the perfect 10 and taking this and, and parading her around and making her the focal point. And by doing that, and then at ringside, nobody would ever touch her other than fans. But, and then when Dusty slapped her one time and, and, uh, on, on an interview on a TV end of the TV show one time and I hit the ring and and you know so it really exploded and meant something when something like that happened nowadays when anything is done it is done for instant gratification okay and the reason that this thing was not only was it new but it was also uh, the there was nobody that that had as much heat as this situation because nobody could ever make a comeback. Nobody could ever touch her. And by by not touching her, we did, did nothing but just explode and and multiply the heat. And as long as I could walk out with a championship belt battered and beat up, it didn't make any difference, if that makes any sense. And they don't, they don't have the same ideas of what heat is today. Um, and I don't need to get into all that. I think I did that on my interview uh, a couple of years ago. But anyway. Was that the, the idea behind putting the perfect 10 with you? 
uh, what you had just talked about about not really being able to to get back at at the girl necessarily and if not what was the, the well concept? no that that was just the way that that I set it up because you you if if you spend all your time beating up the manager then the manager needs to be in the ring okay and if you watch the matches that that Nicola was involved with the only time she ever did anything everything in the in the match changed the tide of battle changed when she did something results happened it wasn't just to get a tiny little oh scream out of the audience and then oh she's just there as as uh, uh, window dressing and and we took it to a different level and then later on and I know we're not talking about JJ but we did the same thing with JJ and except for people got to JJ a little bit much so he became a little bit more of a window dressing thing than an absolute force that that Nicola was because when you look at at the the uh, Great American Bash the first time I wrestled Dusty in the stadium in Charlotte and there was 27,000 people there to watch me get beat so that he could win her for 30 days there there was never a louder scream pop uh, ever than that and I mean it was it was bellowing and I stood in the middle of the ring as he drug her off in the in the golf cart and with my mouth dropped open and was I bleeding yeah. I'm sure I was oh. And you'd lost your belt, and you'd lost me, and you had nothing left. That's right. That's a great uh, uh, point to jump from. What are your memories of the Great American Bash in 85 in Charlotte, or the events leading up to it? And It was hot. I remember just sitting back there and sweating for like eight hours. <laughs> I had this hot. little room. You guys put me in this little coach's room. I had to sit there for like eight hours. But I looked good when I came out. Yeah, you did. <laughs> You did. Got a month vacation, too. Oh, I got to ride with Dusty, and that's when I got put with Sam. Yeah, but he was gone for a while. I mean, you were gone for a while when no, you rode I, off on the horse. I only got like five days off because the heat was too much, remember? They were beating the crap out of me with Dusty because Dusty was dragging me around with a bull rope. Remember at the oh, end of the match, right. he had me. He dragged me off because I didn't want to go back with him, and so he had the bull rope. And because he had a two-seater car, Magnum had a two-seater car, then I got put with Sam, and that whole episode started. That was a bad episode. Yes, it was. We don't need to talk about that. Okay, we won't. I got two kids out of it, though. Yeah, two great kids. Yeah. And I haven't seen Sam in 10 years, so that's cool. I wouldn't know about that. What are your memories? Boy, it's got quiet in here. It is. Are you all nervous talking this honest? What are... Uh, It'll sell more. We're trying to get a bonus. <laughs> Fine with that. <laughs> Baby doll, what are your memories of uh, shooting the promos with Dusty during the, when he won you for 30 days, had you on the, the ranch and, and doing all that? What are your memories of, of that? Was that all shot at one time? No, we did uh, several uh, times that we went out to like Nelson Royal's place and, and different things that we did. One of the things I liked with um, working with Tully and Crockett and Dusty was that we actually had storylines and we had episodes where we could do like little vignettes like where we did the Floyd the Horse thing and then we, I f flew off to Hawaii and spent all of his money and sent him the Hawaiian shirt and he had got the bill for like 15 grand for like booze and Man and all the sundries and stuff, and he did the interview on that. And you had then, men when you were out there? I didn't even go to Hawaii. I went and saw my mom. And I sent you the Louis Vuitton luggage, remember? I got you the Louis Vuitton, the, the garment bag. Yeah. And Dusty's the one, the one my robe's in? <sighs> Let's see, that's another one. Why do I get hooked up with these guys that are jerks? <laughs> oh, every time. The inside joke is Nicholas had my robe for years. Since about ninety six. Probably, yeah. And she was gonna fix it. And now a uh, meth head boyfriend I think has it now. I'm not sure. I don't oh, know God. where it's at. I'm filing a lawsuit against him now. Yeah, he had the house foreclosed on me. I had two weeks to move. Whew. Try moving a four bedroom house in two weeks. You can make a new one. <laughs> 
You get, you're very talented. Yes, I could, can I? I should. <laughs> that would be nice. Okay. I get the hint. You don't have to hit me with a two by four. I got the hint. Well, it's a, it's a bigger deal since the red one got stolen. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Well, the red one got stolen, black one got stolen. I think I still have it, but I'm not sure I got to find it. Yeah, but I can't make a new one. But I can. Okay. Okay. You're awesome. Yes, I am. Well, how much does robes cost you to make? <laughs> well, I tell you, Wahoo, Wahoo's wife made both of, both of my robes, and my black one was $800. And my red one, she was mad at me about something, and she charged me fifteen hundred for the red one. And then the white one that I wore at Starcade. Mm -hmm. I think so. Was that it? That wasn't the I Quit match. That was Dusty when he had the when he had Tully written on the side of his head. War Remember games. You had, the white one. Mm -hmm. You had. I thought you had that made for. I think for so. Starcade though. I don't remember. Anyway. There was a white one. She had that ring. made for me. Yeah, I didn't get in the ring with you on that one. That and uh, I gave that to a charity years ago at a Roman Gabriel golf tournament, and they sold it for for jillions of three, dollars. Yeah, three grand or something like that. But it helped. It helped the charity. So anyway, are those things good? They work. Yes, they do. Okay, Let's cover up the title. Full throttles are wonderful. Charge them. Yeah. Charge them for the free plug. It's a Coca-Cola product, too. Is it? Mm-hmm. Ooh. I don't even drink sodas anymore. Remember how yeah. much Pepsi's and Cokes I drank? I haven't had one since August. Awesome. Yeah. I thought I had a brain tumor. I had a headache for like five days. I had to go to the emergency room. I had a spinal tap and a CAT scan. When they gave me the mixture of Demerol and morphine, I felt a lot better. <laughs> but since then, I can't drink sodas. No kidding. Yeah, no kidding. Isn't that weird? This really is a reunion. We haven't seen each other since... Dallas. Like, Dallas. Like two years ago? Two or three years ago. Yeah. That is pretty wild. Mm -hmm. I guess going through, uh, chronologically through the career, we touched on the Great American Bash. What are your memories, both of you, of heading into Starcade with Magnum TA and the I Quit match? I felt so sorry for Tully. Magnum, you guys beat the crap out of each other. No, no, he beat the crap out of me. When we did the deal, I where, couldn't, I where, couldn't where beat we did the, crap the kiss, we were, he ripped my shirt and we did the kiss thing. If people listen to that and hear you guys hit each other. But that's what sells tickets. There were 30, the Omni was sold out and Greensboro Coliseum was sold out. Mm -hmm. It was good. 33,000 people. A lot of take that's a lot of people. Even at ten dollars a head or fifteen dollars a head, I don't even know what the price of tickets were. So paid for the limo. <laughs> what are your memories of the match itself? I mean, it's something that people still talk about and try to replicate today. Well, it's uh nobody can replicate it and uh you know it had to be pretty good if Vince put it on his greatest cage matches of all time, you know, and uh, it was... Do you get was, any money out of that from Vince? Do you get any money from that stuff? A little bit. I think I get... Well, because I need bit. to get some money, too. I've not gotten a check from Vince ever, and I'm on a lot of his stuff. Well, but... No buts. The, well, there's a, there's, a long, there's, a, there's a short, long story to all that. I know, I signed the back of my checks and that was we it. We all signed the back of our checks. But we had no idea actually, that 20 years later they I would actually, be I money. actually had lunch with the attorneys um, Tuesday that uh, put all that on the back of our checks. And on the back of our paychecks back in those days, it said that to endorse your check, they had a stamp on there that you gave up all rights to the video to the this to the that da, 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 da. Whatever and, done that and, and you'd look at it and, and you'd go I know this isn't right but I need the money <laughs> I need the money and you'd sign it and ch cash your check and when WCW sold the archives to Vince excuse me Vince owns them mm -hmm. and um, the only reason I think that 
and don't get me wrong, I don't get very much money, but is because Arn and I went up there and signed a contract. Okay. And we're under contract, and that's that so contract still still in effect. Okay. So I, I don't know. Uh, I they just did an interview with JJ about the Four Horsemen, and I don't think I think they told him he didn't get any money from it. Wow. So I you know it's the rights are gone, and Vince has got them, and I'm just kind of blown away. And I don't like Vince. Well. Why don't you like Vince? We don't have enough tape. Uh, just because he exploits well, we got people. Enough tape. Huh, because he exploit <laughs> because of the exploitation of the business. Um, instances like Terry Taylor, where you know Terry's a good worker, Terry's a, a a good guy, and yet he made him the Red Rooster, just for the sake of he could. True. Yeah. And Dusty with the polka dots. He did that just because he could. Yeah, and Dusty got, made a lot of money with polka dots. Well, that's true. A and, whole lot of money. And then the, the deal with the girls, you know, exploiting the girls, and because they know that the girls will do anything to get on camera, and they let the girls do anything to get on camera. And I think it's sad because the girls five years from now will not have that job, and they'll still have to, like, face their past, and it's going to be sad. When you were in crime, Yeah, but you, don't, you can't really be mad at Vince because of that. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> Would you have done anything to get on TV back when you started, though? No. No. I've always held myself self up to higher standards than anyone else. And that's why I'm a legend, and they will not be legends. You agreed with there that, you Tony. Have. I was interested to hear with you answering that question for her. I would expect Baby Doll to say that, but you, you immediately said she wouldn't have done that either. No, she wouldn't have, because it was, you're, you're brought up different. We, we talked uh, about being second generation, and, and you just have a different perspective uh, on what the business is. then you knew my dad, is. you knew the standards that my dad upheld me sure. to, too. She couldn't have gone home. Mm -mm. I wouldn't have wanted to go home. Uh -uh. Was anything ever, ever uh, pitched to you or brought to you, baby doll, that you didn't, you didn't think was appropriate or didn't want to do? Um, not during the Crockett time. Sometimes afterwards, like when doing some indie work and some other stuff, yeah, but not with Crockett. Crockett, and especially Tully. Tully watched out for me because Tully had the whole, he had the big picture in mind where I think most of the ideas went to you first and you cut them off short on a lot of those because they were going a little bit far and it just didn't make sense. Like when we did the fire thing, they were going to have me do the fire and you said no. Have you do it? Because it would make more sense because then we all had heat and it was all the storyline and everything made sense. And that's, that was cool about it because you didn't have more heat than I did and I didn't have any more heat than you did. And it all worked together. And that way we had, we were so much above everybody else because instead of being like this, we were all like this. Because you are a genius. You're the only one that thinks so. Well, because I know so. <laughs> uh, one, uh, one thing that we if the people on, if the people on camera could watch y'all back there trying to come up with a question that's going to shock us <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know we're not going to shock you tonight but uh, a lot of people that we talked to that, that worked for the Crockett's would uh, always talk about how much Dusty was infatuated with Baby Doll and how that might have affected the way he booked some things to have you closer to him uh, would you agree with that statement being? Who split? wouldn't want to be next to Baby Doll? You know, I was the only girl. I made salsa and chips when we went on the plane. Very good salsa and chips. <laughs> Homemade, home fried. And that's like, I've always been the perfect ten. I've always upheld myself to that level. I mean, they gave me that. She's they a gave me that cook. label. They gave me that label, and I upheld it. I did all the driving, I did most of the travel bookings. I did all the hotel reservations. I got you guys to the buildings, back to the hotel. Got you up in the morning. Made sure if we had breakfast, we had breakfast going. I mean, I took care of a lot of stuff, didn't I? And then she ran off with Sam Houston. <laughs> and killed the whole stinking deal. See, it sounds like you got the questions that are going to be shocking to me, Tommy. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was just a statement. That wasn't a question. No. <laughs> and she knows it's the truth. I know it. I know. <laughs> but you do have two great kids. Yes, I do. So you can't tra you can't okay. get rid of that. No. Nothing to trade that. No. Um, I think we've stumped them. Yeah. Well, I was, I was actually gonna gonna play off that and ask if you thought maybe that was why Dusty took you away from Tully and put you with himself, or if not, what were the the well, ramifications? Why do you for Why that? do you think Dusty did anything? I was like the hottest thing that they had. Why wouldn't he want to be with me? You know, and and because it just added to him and it made him even more than what he already was. Well, it was just it was just the next chapter of we'd already done a whole year and it was the horseman thing started to blossom a little bit and to be to probably one of the more in and, and this is a speculation on my part probably one of the things that needed to happen was to take care of JJ who worked in the office and get him off of managing guys on uh, the first match opening and middle card yeah and so when when Dusty when she and I had the split and Dusty came out and saved her and protected her then you 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 had a whole new avenue of Tully Dusty, which kicked us for another year, and uh, it got JJ elevated. So there there's there's certainly some maneuvering that not everybody's aware of that instigated thing, but. The business, it was good when she went with Dusty and business prospered and the Four Horsemen thing kicked off out of that. And it was a good transition. Another theory that I've heard uh, some, of the, some of the guys from that were in your locker room say that they rolled Baby Doll off because you had some heat because of uh, your wedding announcement. It was announced in the paper of Charlotte back when you know, kayfabe was sacred and they, I think you were they announced you and Sam used to be married, and it, it kind of went against the storyline. Do, do you have any memories of that? Well, I didn't have a wedding announcement in the Charlotte paper. I, um, I actually had the wedding in Lubbock, Texas, which is like 1,400 miles away. N not an I, announcement per se, but it was reported in the paper. Oh, no, they didn't have that. We had a, they had done a newspaper article, and I guess they had taken a picture of Sam and myself, and I said a constant companion was one of the things, that how they worded it. And I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. huh. yeah. I called Sam my constant companion, and it kind of stuck in Dusty's crawl a little bit. I'm, I wonder why. I don't know. Only you can answer that. <sighs> I, <know. laughs> I have never seen you blush before. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's go to the next question. What are uh, your memories <laughs> or your thoughts on the actual angle where they split you two? Um, pretty was it considered controversial or shocking at the time when you actually you actually struck Baby Doll and and they actually split you two apart? It was very good. Of course, it was controversial because uh, it was it was the least of what they expected. The people didn't expect it to ever happen. And then when he knocked me down and Dusty came out, people were just like, now what's going to happen? They had no idea because they didn't know if I was going to turn on Dusty or if I was going to go back with Tully or if I was going to leave or if I was going to go with Magnum. There were so many questions that came up from it that it just drew people even more into the, into the storyline, into the, into the whole feature. True? Yeah. So I've gotten smart now, Yeah. So all those times that I thought you weren't listening, you were? That's right. Every word. <laughs> kind of scary, huh? Yes. I'm just Blonde kidding. and smart. And I bleach my hair. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. I'm blonde and I bleach my hair. You're not a natural? I'm a natural blonde, but I'm just not this blonde. 
Oh, okay. I'm blonde, but I'm not this blonde. Oh, okay. And that's why my kids shake their head and walk away and walk away and just go, Mom. Because <laughs> I do some goofy stuff. <laughs> and then my girls, little goth chicks. So they've got, when their hair grows out, they've got the white. Instead of having dark roots, they've got white roots. So it looks really weird. One dyes her hair red, one dyes her hair black. Okay. And they're all in the black. But 14 and 16, I figure they can either be showing everything or covering everything up. So I'd rather go for the covering everything up. That works. Yeah. After uh, after the split, <laughs> it's almost it, it's almost not even worth going back to wrestling. It's almost better just to hear you guys reminisce and talk. <laughs> It almost feels feels like a, a waste to ask you about wrestling at this point. Um, you got make, two hours to fill, though. Let's go. I got things to do. What uh, What were your thoughts about? What could you be doing at two in the morning? Oh yeah, we could talk for another hour and a half about this. Um, How did you get down here so fast? That's what I want to know. Because I've got someone you've waiting. Ne- you've I've never got someone been- waiting at the hotel. That's ah uh, okay. <laughs> now I see. I thought it was just payback, <laughs> making me wait. No. Uh, how did you feel being put with Dusty and, and actually turning babyface? Was that something that you were that you were really into and excited about, or did you think there was more mileage to be gotten out of out of you with Tully? I didn't like being babyface. I like being a heel. I'm not a babyface at all. It's, it's, uh, being babyface is hard work. God, you got to be nice. I wouldn't know. You've got to be nice, and I don't like being nice. You know, and you, and it's too like. Yay, you know, and stuff, and I'm not a yay person. <laughs> so for you, it was actually harder to yes. travel as a baby face. And then it's harder being around Dusty, too. I mean, I like being around Tolly, and, and Dusty was rather difficult because he just. He chewed tobacco when it was nasty. Are there any other uh, any other habits Dusty had that you didn't approve of? Not that I care to elaborate on, no. <laughs> he is still married, right? So I can't go into that. I don't know if he's. I think he is. Okay, but I don't yeah, know. Like um, what were the circumstances that led to you, <laughs> Baby Doll, eventually turning on Dusty again and going back to being a heel, being the role maybe that you, you said you were more comfortable in? Um, getting to work with Flair and out of the two matches I remember most was the Starcade match and the match in Charlotte Coliseum on that Sunday afternoon when I put Flair's foot on the rope and that whole place gasped. That was that was a pinnacle of my career right there. When when I put my foot when I put Flair's foot on the rope and just kinda stood there and it's like I didn't do anything. I thought twenty five thousand people were about to kill me. I was wondering how in the world am I going to get out of this place? I am dead. How far in advance did you know you were going to do that with Flair? Was it something that they just told you that that day? I don't remember. Probably that day. For me, it was probably that day because pretty much they told me like on the way to the ring, you guys were telling me what I was supposed to be doing. I'm like, okay, let's go. You know, I was kind of, because I wasn't in the loop. I had, like, my dressing rooms off to the side or I was off to the other places. Yeah. And then you guys kind of did your things, and then you would tell me what I was going to do, and then we go do our stuff. But I wasn't, like, it, I wasn't, like, one of the boy boys. I was I was one of the boys, but I was off in my own, in my own little world. That wasn't bad. No. Tully, did you, how did you feel when Baby Doll was turned heel and put back kind of with the horseman group, but not necessarily with you per se. Well, you got to look at the big picture. I mean, the the horseman was was the hottest thing that wrestling had ever seen at that point. You'd never had uh, a group of guys together, and you you had tag teams, and you had so-called stables, and you had all this kind of stuff, but you never had a group of guys that were the champions that that could perform could do the things that we could do and that's why people 20 years later are still talking about the horsemen mm-hmm. 
you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, they're not talking about NWO and they're not talking about Degeneration X and they're not talking about many of the other things that they've tried. They're not talking about the other forms of the Four Horsemen. They're talking about the first groups, you know, and, and Ole was not the best group. I mean, it was, he just happened to be there for a little while before he got fired. And then Luger didn't fit at all. And, uh, and what do you then, think was the best combination of the four horsemen that you guys had? Well, the best big picture group was when Barry was when Barry was there, and uh, because you had you had Arn and I as a tag team, then you had Barry and Rick as the singles, and you know it was <laughs> it was by far the strongest group because everybody could perform. You know, I mean, we you were limited with with Luger and and Ole. To some extent, they couldn't do certain things and cer with with certain people, and so you ha they had to be worked around. But when you had when you brought Barry in, all four of us could work with anybody, and and perform at a at a at a new level, and that was that's why it was the strongest and and why it lasted so long. Was and, there? Oh, I was going to say like whenever we did the di the deal, whenever I turned. I think that was the first time that you guys started doing the four when every, you guys were walking back from the ring. I think that's the first time that you started doing the four for the four horsemen was on the way, way back to the ring, way back from the ring. Remember that? Was it? Mm -hmm. I, I, I really don't, but it was. I think that was, the first, that was the first time like on camera that you started doing the fours. That's very possible. Mm -hmm. Was there a, a defining moment for you, Tully, in the, the formulation of the horsemen where you realized that, that this was something truly special and this was, was something bigger than, than what had come along. That, wasn't it? Um, in Philadelphia. The guys that were sitting on the front row with the, with the suits. That was in Greensboro. Was it Greensboro? Yeah. Okay. No, that was in Greensboro. Uh, a group of college students in Greensboro would bring their sunglasses, their suits, coats and ties, and sit on the one Shut whole up. row. And they had flashcards. And Crockett, I can remember sitting in the tunnel saying, And they were heel fans. This thing's getting over. And yeah. I just looked at him and said, uh, yeah. I gave him some kind of smart aleck answer. And, uh, but it was, it, 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 it was, I think I think the thing that really probably impacted me the most though was as I was driving to the airport probably 1986 maybe 1987 and I pulled up behind a school bus and I was just talking on the phone or something and one of the kids in the back of the school bus recognized me and I watched school kids stick four fingers out of both sides of the school bus and I was just stunned of that kind of recognition and the impact that we had you know, it's one thing at a wrestling match to get reactions, but at 3.30 in the afternoon when school's let out, as you're dashing through traffic on Woodlawn trying to get to the airport in time so you don't miss your plane, just unbelievable the impact that, uh, that we experienced. Uh, well, you even said the same thing, like even going down the road 65, 70 miles an hour we'd be passing people and they'd recognize us. And you said that it never happened to you in your oh, career. Oh, absolutely. Never happened to anybody, except Flair. So you had to have the tall blonde with you. That's it. Maybe I should have dyed my hair blonde. No. no? Chestnut was good. Along maybe the other side of the spectrum, being, you know, basically really being the top heels not only in the territory, but she in, would never in, in sit the this world. close to me back then either. Well, I stood behind you so you looked bigger. 
Were, <laughs> Thank you. Were there any uh, overly negative experiences with fans uh, at the buildings or, or um, trying to get in the buildings, anything? See, having really? windshields and side windows and rear view, view. mirrors and side mirrors and... The really and truly, I mean, you, you've got a few isolated incidences away from the building. Okay, uh, I know one time we were leaving the Richmond Coliseum and they broke broke. Uh, I think one of my side windows yeah. out, and that was a pain in the rear driving three hundred miles with an empty stink with a with a window going. But the, this this is the thing about about if you treat people with respect. And the horsemen treated people with respect. I always treated people with respect. So we, we really didn't have the issues like that except leaving the ring. You know, and the rare, rare occasion out in, out in the public because the people respected your abilities and Johnny Valentine always taught me this. He said, if they respect your ability, they'll hate you even more. And that's the level where, I, where my goal was, where the people respected my abilities and respected what I did in my performance. And then the heat that I got was real heat. It wasn't kick somebody in the balls type heat. And, and that's what we did. We didn't do a bunch of silliness, but everything we did meant something. And the impact just built and built and built and built. And then the first real climax, the first time anybody ever did anything, was when I lost her at, at uh, the Great American Bash. So you had six months of, of build up for that. And then the next, thing was when when uh, Magnum kissed her and came out and had the big fight but the kiss was was the impact but that did nothing but fuel uh, the angle and, and on into the next thing and it was you know we, we had we had the ability to grab a hold of this thing instead of trying to pour it out for one day or for one show or to get people to watch it next Monday or whatever we could we could let this thing build does that make sense uh -huh. talking about uh, being a horseman and, and the style of all of you was there ever a process of trying to kind of cultivate your style or was it all just just instantly it clicked the the, the four of you or the group all kind of had a similar presence and projected a similar aura about you talking about being you know the best in the ring and, and wanting to have people respect your abilities and hate you even more was there any kind of cultivation process to that or was it all totally natural it just happened you know really and truly I mean I mean if you really think about it and I've talked to a, a number of people doing interviews over the years you know I mean P flair was a baby face in this part of the country for a long long time and the people wanted to like flair it was difficult to keep him as a heel and uh you you talk to arn arn's a very likable guy i mean arn's kind of like a little teddy bear thing cuddly and uh that kind of thing and and i was and the scales were kind of balanced but I was the only one that really kept everybody on the heel side because my, my natural arrogance and my cockiness and my persona that I projected was, was that way. And so when I would do things and then they would jump in and we would hold somebody down and Flair would jump off on their leg or hit them with a baseball bat or something like that, that kept us all on the heel side. I'm sure that this could probably be a DVD all unto itself, but what are some of the, the favorite or your most memorable stories of traveling with the horsemen for, for either of you? Are, are you wanting to ask about uh, 
riding in first class in the airplane or traveling on a private jet or a limousine or do you want to know about the parties? Be a little more specific. Any, any place that you would like to start, quite I'll, frankly. I'll ask about the parties. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would. I was amazed at how many girls y'all went through. Y'all had girls in the morning before you left for the bill. Okay, okay. In the morning before you left for the plane, as soon as you got to the town, before you went to the matches, after you got for, to the match, after we got back to the hotel, went to the bar, and then another girl. I just stood back in awe. Well, we won't even ask you who you were talking about, so. All of y'all. <clears throat> y'all were all single and, and all, all <laughs> single, a lot of money, traveling, town to town, no regrets, no remorse, just. I like I'm it. not touching that. I like it. I like it at the time. You know, but she's worried about whether Dusty's still married or not. You know. No, it's about the, the story. No, the, um, I liked it that you guys would have girls in the hotel room before we even checked in. There'd be a girl in the hotel room waiting on y'all. I missed that one. I never quite figured out how that one. How she knew what room you were in, and waiting for you. And we, and we just landed an hour ago. And this was before cell phones or anything, so you couldn't text her and say, hey, I'm on my way or whatever. She was in the hotel room waiting for you. Not me. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Okay. Um, any famous or, or maybe <laughs> even better than a famous story would be an unknown story about Traveling I think we've had enough unknown <laughs> stuff already. <laughs> About traveling and, and just being in the presence of Ric Flair. Any great Ric Flair stories to tell? Well, you better ask Flair. Get him firsthand. We're trying, but we're digging until he gets off a contract. Well, you know, when he turns 70, he'll be off contract, and then he'll need something to make a living. You can get DVDs out there. Flair with his coffee and tuna fish sandwiches first thing in the morning. Ooh. Oh, God. <sighs> and Flair is always, what you see on TV, that's Flair 24 hours a day. There's no deviation. There's nothing different. Flair is Flair all the time. I mean, what you that's see. That's why he was successful. That's right. But what I hated was waiting that, that 45 minutes to an hour after he'd shower, he'd be walking around combing his hair because he'd never liked to blow dry his hair. And we'd have to wait for him to get ready and, and have him air dry his hair. Remember that, walking around with the comb? And I'd be wanting to get out of there. And he'd be walking. <sighs> well, he maybe had a tendency to be a little high maintenance. <laughs> he was the original high maintenance. <laughs> and what, a thousand step ups? Remember the thousand step ups before every match? And Hindu squats? I was proud of you when you started doing squats with us. Mm -hmm. I kept up too, didn't I? Mm -hmm. And then the next day I couldn't go downstairs with crap. <laughs> How crazy or hectic was the travel schedule itself? Any particular stories that you remember of just being, it felt like you were never going to never gonna make it home again? Let me see. When, Wednesday morning, we'd have to be at interviews at what, 8 o'clock in the morning? 8, 9 o'clock. We'd do interviews all day long. We'd get our check. We'd go cash our checks. We'd, ri we'd ride to Raleigh, 150 hard miles. And Raleigh is not an easy trip from here. So we'd go to Raleigh, work Raleigh. Then we'd have maybe Norfolk and Richmond on Thursday and Friday. Then we'd have to drive all the way back to Charlotte, catch a 7 o'clock flight to go to Atlanta TV. You guys had worked twice in Atlanta TV in a building that was, what, 40 to 50 degrees with, what, 20 people in there? Maybe 20 people. Maybe. Uh, work that, and I remember the studio being cold, cold, cold all the time. Yeah. And then having to work a match in front of, like, nobody that would sell... Yeah all over the world. 
then we'd have to catch, what, either a 3 o'clock or a 5 o'clock flight out of Atlanta. Just have enough time to maybe grab something to eat on the way to the airport. Fly out of Atlanta, maybe go to Baltimore, Philadelphia, something like that. Work that show. Then catch another flight the next Sunday morning out at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock to go to the next town. And then work a double on Sunday. And then Monday have, like, what, Greenville? Or, or um, someplace. Yeah. There was usually two towns running on Monday. Then Tuesday was TV, and then Wednesday started all over again with promos. Yeah, and we had 15 days off that year. Yeah. And maybe we had, what, went maybe three or four hours of sleep at the most at one time? Mm, maybe. Maybe. Well, I maybe slept more because you drove. Try doing that for a year. Give me. Yeah. <laughs> Today I do. Usually I have like I the little. I would harass the crap out of you with that thing. I had. I usually have like the little diamond thing, but I lost it, and so I had to deal with the pink thing. So, and I usually don't want to run this big, but it looks like I've got two. I'm gonna get the other side done, so I've got snake bites. How old you say you were? Just forty-five. You look good for forty-five. I am good for 45. <clears throat> yeah. No, really. No. Unbelievable. I had to. I had to wait. Look, no, I had no. to wait. I had to wait 21 years to touch that stomach. <laughs> but then, see, I would have been one of the years. many instead of one of the few. If you were. Cut my comment off. <laughs> are we text messaging or yeah, wait? Yeah, I'll be done here in a second. Tell him to get a life. Okay. See, here we go. We're trying to make money and trying to reunite the legend, Baby Doll, and Tully Blanchard, and She's got boyfriends on the stinking cell phone. Cell phones didn't get in the way 20 years ago. Didn't have one. Yeah, cell phone yeah. was this big. <laughs> you had to get the battery, the battery you had to carry space. over your shoulder. <laughs> God, yeah. Oh, goodness gracious. Let's go. One Keep thing, on rolling. Uh, one thing that, that we neglected, we kind of glazed over it, was uh, the angle with Baby Doll dressed up as a security guard. What were your memories of, of that night and that whole... Me? Uh, that whole incident, that whole angle. Trying to find a roll of quarters on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> that was difficult. That was, was when, that was when you came back after the 30 days. Mm-hmm. And they handcuffed me to the bottom rope, and that hurt. It hurt my wrist really bad. Because they did it way, way, way too tight. Plus, then I was fighting against them, too. Mm, they, didn't, they didn't handcuff you that, that when, when you brought the quarters. No, but that was one of the deals. Yeah, but when you dressed up like a security guard, you brought the quarters down to me, and then mm -hmm. you left. Right, I gave you the kiss. And, and, I hit, I, and you and got I mad hit, at me because I, I hit, gave you the kiss. And I hit Magnum, and the place went silent. And that was the that was the start of the to Focus go to the cage target. match. Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal when you're twelve thousand people and all of a sudden it's just dead silent. I'm glad that the uniform fit too. Me too. Because I was a big girl. Mm-hmm. A lot bigger than you are tonight. Did you stand up for the camera and show everybody? No. Please do. Give him one baby doll shot. Give him a twirl. Give him a twirl. Because I worked hard on it. Pretty good, huh? This is... <laughs> this... Dude... Look at the camera. It's over there shaking. <laughs> I don't know if that's the guy behind it or... It's both. It's both? Mm hmm I used to do that, too. There was just more of me to, like, shake the camera with. Mm-hmm. I gave new meaning to junk in the trunk. <laughs> I 
he's laughing. <laughs> It wasn't that funny. <laughs> to him it is. <laughs> to him it is. I made a guy in Kansas City trip on the curb when I was coming up here today. He actually fell over. And his friends were all laughing at him. He said, it's worth it. She looked at me. Well, you still got it. I never lost it. Well, okay. I just had I to have, so... It's no, no, no. I just had the smack on the ass in August that I was told to get out there and look good because it was a waste for me to be sitting in Joplin, Missouri all by myself. Okay. So I started doing the Bruiser Brody diet. The Bruiser Brody diet? Mm hmm What is that? Tuna fish and green beans. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, it works. Yeah. It better. It does. <laughs> you uh, you both touched on it a little bit, but talking about nailing Magnum and 12,000 people go silent or putting Ric Flair's foot on the rope and you hear everybody gasp, what are some of the other most memorable crowd reactions that you guys remember from over the years, things that really, that really stand out? And, and I don't I don't want to sound condescending, okay, but our job was to make people scream, mm -hmm. and we did a lot. So there's nothing that really stands out except for a couple of times where you shock the people, and most of the time we didn't get paid to shock the people. We got paid to get beat up, and when you get beat up, people were screaming and watching Dusty with the elbow pad and. The road warriors with the clotheslines and the press slams and all that kind of stuff, and we just got beat up a lot. So I mean, people screamed a lot. I liked that it when the little girl kicked me in the back of the legs in Culpeper, Virginia. The little like ten-year-old girl came up on ringside and just nailed me in the back. How of do the you leg. remember all this stuff? I can remember stuff that I wore too, God. or being in the cage and them shooting those little Brad things in the back of my legs, and I was all bruised up for about a week afterwards. Cause I, I, where was I gonna go? I was 15 feet up in the air, hanging from the cage in Greensboro, and someone either had a slingshot or something and was shooting those things at me, and you can't look and see where they're coming at because they're gonna hit you in the face and probably like put your eye out, and then so you just yeah. take it and they were nailing na 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 me in my butt in the back of my legs with those little things that look like the little legs and little circle things. And they were shooting those things mm. at me. Or like being in the cage on the floor and having people just douse you with beer. They didn't like me at all. They just didn't know you. Then they really wouldn't like me. That's not true. Hmm? I like the first time that I went to Kroger's in Charlotte. And I was, after we'd had the TV, and uh, I was shopping, it was like really late one night, and people recognized me, this couple recognized me, and they, you would kind of get the look, and you know, I'm like walking through the grocery store, and they circled back around, and they're coming back at the aisle next to me, and I'm kind of expecting them to ask something, you know, you're saying like, hey, you're so-and-so, or what are you doing here, or whatever, and they look at my cart, and they just, just kind of like giggle and laugh and walk away, and so I'm like, well, and I look down at my cart, and I've got Cheetos and tampons, and I'm thinking, if I'm going to be a star, I need to have something else in my cart besides Cheetos and tampons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then y'all made me get rid of my American Tourister luggage. Because you said if I was going to be a star, I had to have better luggage. So oh, we God. went to Vegas and I spent like $1,400 on two pieces of Louis Vuitton luggage. I'm not sure that you needed to spend 1400 but yes. Well, I had to keep up with y'all. And everybody mm -hmm. had the Louis Vuitton. And everybody mm -hmm. had the Rolexes going. I never did get I the Rolexes. I had a Gucci. I never did either. Uh -huh. I had the Geneva watch. You had the one with 144 diamonds in it. Remember you made me count all the diamonds at one time? <laughs> he made me count the diamonds in it. Are there any other memories Those you have? Those were the days. Any other memories you have of uh, having to keep up with the horsemen? <sighs> That's when she, when she listened to me. I listened. It's just not whether I did it or not. I always listened. <laughs> I didn't always do as I was told. Mm -hmm. Just think if I if I'd done everything that you told me to, how much money I would have had in the bank. 
You don't even want to go there. I don't even want to know, do I? No. If I'd have listened to what I told you. I'd have <laughs> And just think if we'd never gotten married and just saved all of our money. Just think if you'd have married me. One just of us think if you'd have spent your time chasing me like you chased them other guys. Good God. One of us would have been dead by now, though. Nah. No. I couldn't whip you. That's right. Just remember that. <laughs> Did it ever cross your mind to go for Tully 20 years ago? Well, that's an on-the-spot question. <laughs> how, how long do we live together? Well, Tully, I, I could tell you were thinking bedroom. it just reading your face, so I just wanted to ask it for you. No, we've, <laughs> we've always had... If, if we'd ever done anything, I think the dynamic of it would have been totally different. And we always had... I don't know, it's just... We've always had just a really... Well, cool we, set, we, set that, we set that ground rule down at the beginning because if it would have got personal, then... It wouldn't have worked. Well, it, it would have worked, but but you'd you'd have got emotional instead of instead of being able to be strictly big picture. What's the best thing for the match? What's the best thing that happened? And so it was, and it was hard sometimes. I mean, the thought crossed my mind for sure, especially when when uh, we were living together, and she was in this bedroom and I was in this bedroom. And uh, I made pecan pie. She made a great, she made a great Cornish hen thing. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. I'm a really, really good cook. Really, really, good, really cook. good cook. And I look good doing it too. David, if I would have asked you uh, 20 years ago, would you believe that Tully was doing what he's doing today? Could you even fathom it? Mm -mm. Not at all. I'm very proud of him. <laughs> My little warrior for Christ. Absolutely. How is his personality different now compared to then? It's the same. My personality is the same? Mm -hmm. same? Is it really? Yeah. Except I'm not saying F this and F that well, every other word. Well, like <laughs> instead of like being at a 10, you're like at an 8. <laughs> just, just a little down. That's just because I'm old. Yeah, but you're alive. Mm-hmm. And feeling good. Yep. And what's sad is I could name off 20 guys right now that aren't with us anymore. Yeah. And that's sad. It is. You know who I miss most of all? Bubba, Ray Trailer. I think I've done all the legend shows and things. He's the one that I miss seeing the most. Yeah. Really, really good guy. Is there is there anything, Baby Doll, to, uh, I don't know if you even have ever heard this, but there's a little bit of an urban legend that there was an angle proposed that never happened where the implication was that Big Bubba had attacked you and forced himself on you in a car. Have you ever heard this story? That's a new one. I thought he was going to come up with the envelope. Everybody asks about my envelope. The, the implication, it's on, uh, it's on one of the Jim Cornette shoot interviews, I think. The, I've never heard that. The implication was going to be that, that throughout the course of the TV show, Baby Doll had gone missing and no one could find her. And at the end of the show, they would find you uh, in the backseat of this car, unconsolable and hysterical. And as they're pulling you out of the car, uh, Dusty, s s you hear a crack. And the camera zooms down. And what the crack is was Dusty stepped on Big Bubba's sunglasses. And that would be how they would implicate Bubba in the, uh, in the attack. Was that, of an angle. was that anything that was ever actually, I guess not ever actually brought up to you? Never heard it. I was, I was out of the mainstream if it was. I never, I've never heard of anything between Bob and myself. The only thing that Ray and I had was whenever I knocked Cornette out in Raleigh and he said, Doll, you hit him, you really hit him. <laughs> there was a lot of people that would have liked to hit Cornette. I did on more than one occasion. What are uh, both your memories of working with Cornette? Obviously, you got you did the angle in '86. He was and then... mean to me. He said that I was at the moose section, the junior moose section, and I gave him a lot of material to work with. <laughs> and he took advantage of it too, and it hurt my feelings. And they chipped three of my teeth. 
I caught that elbow in the bashes when we were doing the tag teams and stuff, and I was chasing it because Cornette runs like a girl, and he caught me with the elbow, chipped three of my teeth. Cornette runs like a girl. He does. <laughs> Try finding a dentist on 4th of July to come fix your teeth. You know, I still got the bonding from that. I never had it replaced. Really? Uh huh. Had circumstances been different, Tully, how how do you think the Horseman versus Midnight Express feud could have gone or would have gone? Because there's a lot of people to this day that think it would have been huge had certain 88 had circumstances gone different and you and R ended up staying with the company. Were you disappointed that the run with the Midnight Express got cut short? I'm the one that left. I wasn't disappointed about anything. I mean, it didn't get shut and I didn't get fired. You know, I'm, I quit and Arn went with me. So, I mean, it's, I'm sure that, that Crockett probably is a little upset that it got cut short, but, you know, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about that. I got a question for you. Why'd y'all bring Dark Journey in? That was punishment for something. Okay. That was a dusty thing. I'm not was sure. It, was he punishing you or punishing me, or did he bo get us both? Uh, he was punishing me for some, for whatever. I don't know. Okay. Didn't last very long, though. At one point, I think, maybe no, you were sent to Kansas City. Was that punishment for anything that you did? Um, I actually asked to go to Kansas City. I just got married, and I couldn't see having my then-husband being 1,200 miles away and me being in Charlotte, so I actually pulled Dusty aside at, at the Atlanta television and said, if you send Sam, you're going to have to send me too. And I remember that conversation very well. And how did it go? We starved for six months. We showed up at buildings and there would be 16 people there and the posters that should have been out in, in businesses and on telephone poles were being sold in the concession for a quarter apiece. And that's when I decided that, hmm, you couldn't draw a house with Jesus Christ if no one knew that Jesus was going to be there. And so we drove 600 miles for $60 and wrestled in front of 12 people and then went home. When you told Dusty you wanted to be with, with Sam in Kansas City, what was his response? Was he, he just supportive? He, was... No, he shook his head and walked away. Um, they wanted me, and I, I, I guess because I couldn't see the reasoning of it, was that they wanted me to kind of be like a Marilyn Monroe character, but then Marilyn Monroe was married like three times. So I couldn't see how they could keep things, I could see how I could keep things separate, but they didn't want to keep things separate. And they wanted to kind of have the exclusive, like, baby doll was theirs, rather than Sam's. And I see it now as a big picture, and how it would have worked, and I kind of see how Sam played into that, because... Even though I could see Sam as a star, Sam was never going to be a star. And it's just one of those things that you just, you make a mistake and you grow up and hopefully you learn from it. And I learned a lot. That's why I'm still dating wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> in, in 19, I still love you. At the end of, of 88, I just, want, I just want a robe back. Okay. Just I'll get one for you. Anyone. I promise. I will work out. Okay. <laughs> It'll be beautiful and you'll love it. It'll be the best one you've ever it. had. I've never made you a robe. I thought you made the white one. No, Doris made that one. The, what, the yeah, but you, to, you, you had her make it. Yeah, and I designed, you designed it. it. Yeah. yeah, and then, it, yeah. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll do one for you. Okay. Black or red? Black. Or red, white. Red, white? Yeah. Okay. Red or, the, the white one was great. Or black. The white one what was What do you think? Black or, black or white? Black. Black? Black. 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 Red, red lining. Yeah, and I like the, nice. And I like the thing off the back where it said taller. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Continue. Around uh, 1988, <laughs> at the end of 88, <laughs> when, when Tully and Arn went to WWE, Sam Houston was also up there. Was there ever any conversation, Baby Doll, with you and 
anyone in the offices up there about bringing you in and doing anything with you? Vince didn't like me. I wasn't I wasn't girly enough for Vince. I was I was bigger than a lot of the guys that he had. Um, I wasn't the little Miss Elizabeth. I wasn't the... Um, and she was there, and she was being pushed. And mm -hmm. It would have been... See, the, 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 thing that, the thing that you had in 1988 that you don't... You, you really... Not everybody grasped. May, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe it's just my perception. Is we were actually a bigger product, and we didn't understand that. Crockett didn't understand it, and everybody that worked for Crockett didn't understand it. We were a bigger product than Vince was at that time. And when, when Arn and I went up there, it was, I can remember watching guys go out in the audience and tear down Four Horsemen signs. And Vince, uh, you know, he never responded to it other than you pull the, the, the bleachers out. So he certainly wasn't going to have Baby Doll come out there and upstage Elizabeth or upstage anybody that he anything, would yeah. that he had that, that was being, being pushed so yeah. I mean it's you know I mean that that was the, the thing and and the fact that that Arn and I were so hot when we first went there you you look at what we did with Sean and Marty the first three months we were up there was tear every building down and the angles and Saturday night's main event and then before we became the champions you spent three months getting beat by the bushwhackers for heaven's sakes lips are lips oh my god you know i mean you're 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 all of a sudden you're going from superstars to middle of the card getting beat by the luke and shep or whatever his name is luke and butch butch okay you know and and so whatever star status you had all of a sudden is diminished and then you become world tag team champions but your 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 up here level has already been brought down to this level just because Vince could and that's why I don't like him well did you find that your your motivation or maybe your your heart for being around at that time went up and down accordingly or were you still were you were you happy in New York no I, I, I wasn't happy in life at that time and so I wasn't gonna be happy any place really and the thing that the thing that disappointed me the most was Vince reached out to us we responded and went up there and then Vince Vince hired us more to hurt the other company than to help his own company. And the thing that when you go out, like if you've got an NFL team, you go out and get players from other teams to improve your team. Or the Yankees, they go hire somebody that's going to get them into the World Series. And, and it's not to hurt the other team, but it's to improve your team. And that was how Arn and I went there was to be used and improve their team and by the way we got used it was to damage the other team and that was the the, the res that was the ultimate uh, result was six months later after Arn and I are with the WWE Dusty sitting there uh, Barry Windham sitting there um, half of the territory sitting there because the the company had had got rid of them all and uh turner had bought them and, and that kind of stuff and and it was disappointing to me to be number one not be smart enough to see that coming and number two to be used like that and as a pawn so i mean it it was a very disappointing time in my life do you think there were that Vince is a lot of people we do these interviews and they have commented it's kind of a recurring theme that that Vince and the brain trust up there don't really have as firm a grasp on how to effectively use tag teams as they've been used in a lot of the southern territories. Do you agree with that? Well, it you 
Vince Vince's knowledge of the wrestling business came from his dad. I never met his dad, but everything that we did in the South and with Crockett is different than what Vince does. Vince has a babyface champion. They've always had a babyface champion, and the NWA and the South always had a heel champion. So that you've got the underdog and the baby face and the person the people cheer. So you just have basic philosophy differences, okay? And they have never had tag teams uh, that could perform like the ones in the South. So it is all just performance level. And if you don't have the people that can perform, you're not going to push tag teams. Didn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, question for both She's of you. She's gotten so smart, i got to ask now. Question for both of you, and you, you touched on this a little bit, but when did you see the downfall coming for Crockett Promotions? When did you see the end coming? When they hired Dr. Journey? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. I was already That gone. was an indicator. Yeah. I don't know. Well, when we wrestled in Long Island... Okay, what year was that, somebody? One of you trivia guys? Early in 88. 88. Yeah. January, 88. January of 88. And we had just switched Luger Babyface, and it was a very hot thing. And we had some, uh, we had some kind of cage match battle royal thing. And when the match was over with, and Arn and I took Luger out, four guys before the end, and Dusty won the, won the match in the limousine on the way to the Hel Helmsley Palace, I told the Crockett's, I said, this is the Titanic, and you got four engine rooms full. Mm. They were spending a lot of money on a lot of stuff they shouldn't have been spending money on. They should have been promoting their guys rather than living a lifestyle. Well, but that's, if that's an indicator on when things are falling apart. That's what I told them. How about you, Baby Doll? Was there ever a time that you really, you talked about going to, uh, I guess, what was Central States at the time, having just been brought in by Crockett and not doing very well. Was there ever a time that you were like, this thing is really, this is the Titanic? At the time, I was happy to have a job and I was happy to be working. I didn't have the wrestling psychology that I do now, you know, being able to step back and look at it, I was just mainly there to show up and look good and do what I was told rather than think. And I did that very well. Mm -hmm. But listening to, listening to these guys and listening to like to Arn and Flair and Tully and the meetings that they had and having Dusty and, and um, like David Crockett and, and JJ and all them, and just listening to the psychology of it, I learned a lot because uh, I was with the best. I mean, I was with the absolute best. We always talk about wrestling today becoming a lost art of what you guys did in, in your prime. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many guys, Tully, your, your contemporaries that are currently collecting paychecks from Vince McMahon. You actually just had an opportunity to do that as well. Uh, do you think there could ever be a a way to pass the information on from what you guys knew to the current stable of wrestlers and uh, kind of resurrect the product. What's the answer? It's the guys can't work like you guys do now. They don't have the psychology of it. It's all entrances and exits. It's not putting in a 20 minute match. It's not putting in an hour Broadway. It's putting in six to eight minutes, maybe four to five wrestling moves and then you're back to the dressing room. They do more on the entrance to the wrestling, to the ring, than what actually happens in the ring. And the guys today would Well, that's, even, that's the product. The what, guys what today he's, would what not he's know asking, how to, the guys, what, oh. Yeah, but what he's asking is, can it, can it change with my contemporaries, with Steamboat as an agent, with uh, the guys Malenko, and, and can they teach the product. No, because the guys aren't willing to learn because it's not it's a lost art, I think, at this point.
Well, Tully, you can fairly comment on that because you, you had the opportunity to talk with some of these, I guess, called young stars now. Do you think it's really an unwillingness for them to learn from you? Um, it is. I, I think you probably have the same type situation that, that you might have in football. The amount of money that people make today and they, they probably don't respect you to the degree, oh yeah, that's great, that's great, but I make more money than they made. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're not gonna listen to people that you don't necessarily respect and the business has changed and we don't do it like that anymore. So they, in their minds, they're doing it right. And so, and I would agree with, with Nicola that, you know, if you don't want to learn, you're not going to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that people that I grew up in the business with, you had to fight like crazy to get to the main event, to where you were making money, to where you could live. And, uh, and I was speaking in a prison the other day, I said, I drove up in a in a, my '64 Mustang when I was on the first match, and I can remember when I bought my first Cadillac, and I pulled up because I was on the main event. And th there's a big difference in that, and the people uh, that have str that have. Stomach's growling. I haven't eaten today. <laughs> my stomach's That's growling. why you're so skinny. You're starving yourself to death. I've been on a plane, ten hours, to get here. Yeah, but you're, you're staying at the you're staying at the Marriott. They never put me at the Marriott. I'm a little bit offended by that, but and they never flew me in either. We'll work on that. But anyway, <laughs> you know who I think could could probably have did the we best answer matches? that whole question? The, yeah. Out of out of the guys that are working now, though, the ones that I think that probably could do a match that that I enjoy seeing are Jeff and Matt Hardy because they're they grew up in like the '80s whenever we were working, and they take that old school to heart. And I think that Jeff and Matt Hardy would probably be probably one of the, two of the few guys that could probably do a 20, 30 minute match and have it make sense and tell a story. I tell you, one of the best matches that I've that I've seen. And I just happened on it was the match that Shawn Michaels had with with Shane McMahon uh, six or eight months ago. They they did too many things, in my opinion. You know, they went through tables and trash cans and whatever else. But it actually went back and forth, and and it was gray area instead of all this guy and then all this guy, and and uh, uh, which was which was really surprising to me. Um, that Shane could do that stuff, um, but then I would I would agree with with uh, Nicola, the Hardy guys do do a good job, and and when I was up there in October, that there there was some of the guys that that uh, uh, that were willing to listen a little bit, that was that was kind of refreshing. It was nice to see. Uh, uh, Fit Finley and and Steamboat and Tim Horner then and DiBiase uh, setting up the the matches and all that kind of stuff uh, and trying to to get the things across. The thing that the thing that I think that you probably have in place at this point in the overall evolution of professional wrestling is the nature of the business has changed from TV show being your product versus TV show being your infomercial like it was when we were there. And so your end product is the TV show. It's the pay-per-view. It's the big bombs, the music, the pyro, the all the things and you can't go back okay and the reason the house shows suffer if it's just a house show other than TV is because when what you see on TV is the big show it's the big conglomeration of stuff 
And then when you go to the house show, it's just guys walking out of the back. There's no ramps. There's no backdrops. No there's boom. no booms. There's no music. There's no this. So the people over the last 15 to 20 years have seen, well, this isn't what we see on TV, you know. And so you're sitting in a, in a second class, even though it's some of the same guys, but it's not the same show and it's not the same emphasis, it's not the same energy that they get on the TV show. So they've taken it and changed the emphasis where people want to watch the TV show and the pay-per-views where you get the big show, then you get the, then the other stuff. Was there anyone else that really stood out and impressed you uh, as far as your run up there, as far as being willing to listen or, or their talent or anything that really impressed you and stood out? Oh, I, I was I was only there for two days, you know, and, and I just I watched and observed and, and met some guys that I'd never met before and and uh you know, I was I was impressed with the intensity in which uh John Cena does and works. Uh it was it was I I I I don't know that I'd ever met him before. He said I had, but I don't remember where. But uh you know the intensity that, that that he put into his his performance was was very good and uh, Triple H and Sean uh, really uh, they had a tag match with uh, Edge and uh, Barry Orton not Barry Orton Randy Orton Barry's his uncle and uh, Barry's a nut yeah okay. But, he went through Love Up. But Randy is, uh, Randy's, you know, he's, he's tall, he's handsome, he's, he's uh, probably his own worst enemy at this point in his career, but uh, he is, he, he could be the next real mainstay that the WWE has for a long period of time if he, if he, uh, uh, as Sean said, he's he's kind of like I was 15 years ago, a little bit full of himself and not quite as mellow as I am now. So Randy's got a little mellowing that to happen, and uh, you know, and, and you hope to see that uh, his dad was a great performer. Uh, Bob Bob Jr. was just an absolute great performer, and when I first started refereeing, he was in the Texas territory, and I used to referee and watch and. And uh, I learned a tremendous lot from him. And then when I first started wrestling, I read it. I wrestled his grandfather. If you could call it wrestling, I stood there for 20 minutes while he talked to the people. And I learned in that match, too. So. Guess what I saw two weeks ago? Who? So, no, I said, guess what I saw. What? Um, one of the guys I was working with broke, broke both of his heel bones. He jumped off the top rope onto the concrete and shoved his tibia down into his heels. He had surgery on it yesterday. Yeah, you watch the tape and you can actually hear it, the bones break. You can actually hear it when he hits the floor. It's just one of those bad, bad, bad. I felt sorry for the kid. It was bad. Maybe I'll, maybe I've got bad information, but you still actually watch the current product on TV, is that correct? I just started back. Um, I would gotten very disinterested with it, very disgruntled. Actually, I really couldn't watch it because I've got young daughters. My daughters are 14 and 16 now, and the way that they were promoting the girls, it wasn't something that I wanted to be brought into my home. You know, like with, um, I mean, I, I was just, I was different in the way that I, that I dressed, mainly because I had to jump up into a ring, and when you're trying to jump up into a ring that's almost four foot high, I'm not going to, they're not paying enough money to see my ass, okay? <laughs> so, um, I tried to wear something that was... Um, it was proportional. Not, it not only looked good, but it was functional. And so spandex was very good. And now that the girls are getting into the ring and showing everything, it's just like... I would, you know, Playboy called Crockett twice to have me go up there and talk to him. And I turned him down both times. Do you remember the offer they gave you? The number? No, it was it was just to come up there and talk. Was they were they were interested, and I was very flattered by it. 
But then I was thinking, number one, I've got a dad. Number two, I might have kids in the future. And I've got a brother. And I thought, I don't want someone going, hey, this is your mom. Guess what? You know, and stuff later on. And You could have just said it was a body double. Who would? There's no way. <laughs> I mean, I, I can get down to a 27-inch waist, but I still got 40 hips. I can run thousands of miles, and this thing is still going to follow me forever and ever. It's a lot smaller than it used to be. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Both of you have a, uh, I don't remember the ages of your children, Tully, but both of you have teenagers, from what I understand. Do you, are you guys proud to show them what you did in your past? Yes. Are you, are you comfortable showing that? Or? I'm not embarrassed by anything I did. They can, they can watch any of the tapes. They can watch any of the interviews. They can show it to all of their friends, and none of them will go, there's your mom's ass, or God, that's a good crotch shot, or whatever, but... Look at the girls today. Shoot, they can't even get in the ring now without showing half their stuff. And Missy started all that. You can either perform or you gotta sell something. If your That's kids were interested right. in watching the I Quit match, would you would you let them watch it, Tony? I think they've seen it. Yeah. I don't know. I I have I I need to ask them. They've seen some of the stuff, and I've taken them to some of the shows uh, that I've wrestled in the last couple of years. And um, but I don't know if I've seen. I don't. I don't know that I have a copy of the I Quit match. Maybe I do. I think Vince sent you one. Yeah. Sent you the, the DVD. You think? And I'm on <laughs> that one, too. Yeah. I got it. Thank you. Do you still watch Tully? And if not, at what point did you stop watching wrestling? About 17 years ago. I, I very seldom, you know, I flip a little bit every now and then and watch a little bit. If I see Sean on there, or I see somebody I know. But other than that, I don't, I don't really, uh, I, I have a, I have always had a very, very difficult time watching people that really didn't appreciate their craft or their profession. And uh, and that's part of being second generation and part of being raised in the business and part of having the $25 payoffs and empty buildings and still having to go work and still having to go 30 minutes and the things that I had to do when I was young and to respect your craft, pay the price, as it were. In watching, or, or maybe not watching, but just hearing about, was there ever a, a later version of the Four Horsemen that you would have given your stamp of approval of and, and thought you know was close or, or that they had something with? No. They didn't. They couldn't. They tried to sell it as, as Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen, or Ric Flair's Four Horsemen, and that ne it was never Ric Flair's thing. Mm -hmm. Flair was part of the group, and although being the world's champion, he gave great credibility to the group because he was part of it, but it was ne he was never the spokesman mm -hmm. because we could all talk. And... Uh, and so you, you're never going to have the same thing. And, and I just did an interview with the WWE for the, for the uh, DVD that they're coming out with. And I, I said, it's like this. I said, I said you, you can put all these different groups together. I said, as long as you had the three people together, it worked. Rick, Arn, and myself. I said, it didn't make any difference who the fourth one was, but the three of us made it work. And it never missed a blemish with Ole, it never missed a blemish with Luger, and it never missed, missed a blemish with, with Barry. But you take the chemistry 
And that's what it was. It was the chemistry that made it explode and made it happen. And you couldn't put the, put the, the chemistry together. I can remember when, and, I, and Ole thinks, I think Ole got fired because of it. Dude, you never used to rub my back either. Where have you been all my life? Um, you, you, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. What was I saying? Uh, Ole got fired over Oh, and in, in, uh, when was it when they said the four horsemen came coming back on the pay-per-view? Was that 94? Uh, 93, yeah. 93? And, and, you know, and they kept advertising that and kept advertising it. I sent them a registered letter. I'm not coming. You, you know, they offered me 500 stinking dollars to do the deal. You know, and that much. Oh God! Wow. And uh, you know, and and I, I wasn't going to do that, but they kept advertising me, and then they trotted Paul Roma out there. That was that was that was a huge. I bought that pay per view. <laughs> I wanted to see how they were going to explain me not being there and sitting in my house in in Matthews, North Carolina, and it. I mean, you could just, the anticipation of me walking out there and all of a sudden Paul Roma came out there and Flair tried to announce it. And oh, it was like flushing a toilet. It was horrifying. I know something so, about Paul Roma that Sam told me. Ain't no fair. <laughs> Didn't he? I don't know. Oh, okay. I can't tell you. It's kind of like. Sam told me he something. He worked out hard. Yeah. But I could just see that. That would be kind of funny. Yeah. Was love for your craft, Tully, one of the reasons, even if it's being a small factor, that you uh, attempted to become a WWE employee as an agent recently? Um, well, no. It, it. The Bible talks about the steps of a good man are ordered by God. And this door opened, and it was an opportunity. And I didn't, I didn't really understand it, but I went towards it. And uh, when I got there, I saw a lot of people, and it was interesting, and it was, it was very thought-provoking. But when Chris Benoit asked me if I missed it on Tuesday afternoon in St. Louis, uh, and I responded quickly. I said, I don't miss it. And our conversation went on for about another five minutes about how the fact that if you don't really have a passion for something, you really won't excel at it. And my passion for the wrestling business was from 17 years ago, and it's not today. Uh, although I enjoy the wrestling things and the uh, interviews and I'm enjoying cuddling up here with Nicola on the couch, but it is, it is not my passion anymore. And so, you know, I, I could have went up there and, and done the job for six months, a year, two years, and just got through it with my knowledge and understanding how corporations work now. And after working up there many years ago, kind of how the dynamics of that company work. But I would be, I would have been taking money really under just false pretenses. And I can't work just for money. I, I really don't function well like that. Uh, uh, and so I, I talked to John Laurinaitis and said, the guy you want was 17 years ago that thought, 24-7 about wrestling and angles and finishes and that's not me anymore. A couple of uh, follow-up questions to points that you touched on. <clears throat> Do you think, you talked about uh, Vince seeing it as Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen, which I don't know if you realize, but that's actually the name of the DVD is Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen. Do you think that just reiterates that he, he couldn't grasp what the Horsemen really were about? Well, he, he couldn't, but WCW couldn't either. I mean, I'm talking WCW, not Vince, when it came out, Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen. 
the thing that, that Vince, Vince is a marketing genius and the biggest DVD seller they've ever had is Flair's video. And uh, so you're certainly going to stick his name up there up front, you know. And uh, then you got the Four Horsemen. So for, for both of you, was there ever, you talked about Paul Roma being obviously not the right person. Was there ever anyone that either one of you saw as someone that really would have fit the mold to be a horseman perfectly, but just they weren't in the territory at the time, the timing never, never matched up? Was there anyone that ever that really would have been in maybe a, a, a perfect candidate, but it just never happened, it never lined up? <laughs> no one that would have maybe made made a good compliment to you, Flair and Arn, but it just never <clears throat> panned out. Barry Wyndham was the best, and he was he was one. Nobody else. I mean, who who else would there have been? Mm. We could have got Buddy Landell. Um, another common thread that both of you have were at <laughs> at different points of your career, you both worked with Gino Hernandez. Any stories or memories of working with Gino Hernandez? Gino would Hernandez? have been good in there with y'all. Gino would have worked, but he was dead. I said would have. Yeah. I don't know. He, yeah. he would have been a good dynamic in there. Mm -hmm. G Gino and I were a good tag team. And uh, we made a lot of money in Houston. You know who would have been good with y'all? Ted DiBiase, too. Mm, maybe. Eddie Gilbert. Nah. He's too much of a redneck. Um. How about Greg Gina Valentine? Hmm? Yeah. Who? Greg Valentine. Valentine was his style was too different. He was trying to be his dad, and, and was very good at it. But we were we were between sluggers and flyers. You know, we could fly when we needed to and slug when we needed to. And Gino would have been would have been a fit. He probably wouldn't have been uh, like what Barry was. Yeah. Because Gino was uh, Gino was not as solid a performer all by himself. I mean, he was very flashy and very flamboyant and a great talker and and uh, very handsome and and very much of a womanizer. Maybe that's who you were talking about earlier. <coughs> and, what? Uh, uh, that's why I got in the in the business was because of Gino. Gino did a bad thing to her one time really bad really bad told her to meet him at a club that we went to another club she ended up beating the crap out of some guy trying to rape her in the parking lot cut her hand when she grabbed the knife blade I knew right then she was tougher than me Baby Doll, is there, was there ever anyone that you would have liked to have worked with or managed that the, the timing never came up or the opportunity never came up? Hmm. I thought this video was about the reunion, not about the... Could have been. Could have been. I don't know. The if wins. I don't know if there was anybody like at that time. Um, I don't know. I have to be careful because, like, as tall as I am, it'd have to be, like, I don't know. You're taller than me. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. This is about the reunion. Um, what, was, what was the longest period of time that you... Don't be so sensitive. What was the longest period of time that you two ever went without corresponding or seeing each other? This is the first time you've been together on camera in a while, but when was the first time you guys actually met back up again? I don't know. We go a year or two. Uh, first time I saw you probably after I got out of the business was in Amarillo. <clears throat> it 
when you came up to Amarillo when we were doing the prisons up there that time. Yeah, that was a while. That had been like six, seven years at least. Is my daughter, I have my kids. Yeah, probably 95-ish. Yeah. 95, 96. In there. I still know he thinks about me. All the time. Because mm -hmm. I need it. <laughs> what were, uh, I guess, one of the most the most high-profile thing you guys have done together in a few years was the big wrestler union show in Tampa with Tully going against Jeff Jarrett, who had Baby Doll in his corner. What were your memories of that, the reunion weekend or the match itself or the show itself or just being around each other again at a, at a wrestling atmosphere? Um... That was the one that took my girls to. I drove 1,100 miles one way, yeah. took my girls to Tampa. Uh, we worked the show. Um, they had brought me in as, as a secret. I don't think anybody knew I was coming in, just about, uh -oh. just, just what, three or four people. So it was a big surprise for everybody. Um, I like doing the legend shows because I get to see all the guys I used to run the roads with, plus I get paid. And uh, it's like getting paid to take a vacation. And it's cool. There you go. How busy are you staying doing the, the reunion shows or doing independent dates, Baby Doll? Um, up until I, August, I did a, a reunion show in Rockville, Maryland uh, for the NWA Legends convention. And um, I met a guy up there that uh, we just kind of clicked and hit it off. And he was just like, well, why aren't you promoting yourself more? Why aren't you getting out there? And he said, look at you. You need to get out there. He said, these legend things are really going nuts. He said, you really... And he pretty much, he smacked me on the ass and told me, get out there and go do stuff. So now uh, I had like eight dates between August and the end of the year. I got myself booked and got promoted and, and got flown to go do stuff that I really like to do. And then on a lot of the shows, I got to go see him. And then um, I got, I'm working with CWA down in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I'm working um, uh, tonight in North Carolina for high spots and then um, I've got two dates booked in March I've got three dates booked in in April I've got two dates booked in May already I've got two in June three in July one in August and one in September and that's not even trying plus then I'm gonna move back to North Carolina so I can get booked even more you're moving back to North Carolina yes I am between Fayetteville and the beach. I'm living in Joplin, Missouri right now. I'm miserable. Uh, nothing else needs to be said. Yeah. See you, Missouri. I've had enough. <laughs> Show me. <laughs> I've seen enough. Well, it was certainly a pleasure and an honor to have both of you here tonight. Any uh, parting thoughts for the fans or maybe uh, kind of closing statements, memories of your run together, anything that you'd like to maybe leave the fans with? to close us out here? Um, I'd like to say a personal thanks to Tully because without him, none of this would have ever happened. None of the dynamics would have happened. None of the angles, the storylines, the road trips. Tully kept it all in focus. Tully, and I'll say it again, is a genius because he knew how to keep everything going in a straight line. He kept everything to where each of us had heat each of us had no more than the other one had people hated us the office hated us we had so much heat that the office hated us <laughs> but it's all well, because of him the and office thank hated you. me the office didn't hate you oh yeah they did, yes, they did. <laughs> and it was all because of the dynamic of it and and just because of our lives and growing up the way that we did you just put all the pieces of the puzzle together just perfectly. And thank you, because you gave me a wonderful life out of that. And you gave me a lot of great memories. Thank you. She never kissed me way back then either. <laughs> Hot diggity dog. And now she's coming out here and going to move back to North Carolina, and I live in Texas. Oh, my goodness. Oh, well. Yeah, but I'm going to be by the beach. You can come see me. There you go. Is that an invitation? Always. Doors always open to Tully. Ooh. <laughs> we might ought to close on that one. And I'll cook for you. And I'll eat it. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>